Hi everybody, I am that nursing prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about a urinalysis. So let's get into it. As you probably already know, this is a test of your urine. So what can it be used for? It can be used for screening, diagnostic, and monitoring purposes. So as a screening tool, it helps look for unidentified health issues to reduce the risk of future complications. So it can be used as a routine screening tool for people who are not symptomatic. As a diagnostic tool, these are the people who are symptomatic, and then we're using this tool to find the cause of those symptoms. And then as a monitoring tool, we can use it to see how suspected treatments are working or to notice any change in the severity of a condition. So those are the three main ways this test is used. Some common things it is used for. As part of a routine medical exam, to diagnose a urinary tract infection, preparatory before surgery, it's good to get baseline labs, if you have kidney disease or diabetes, this might be part of frequent monitoring for you to get a UA. And then it's very common routine pregnancy screening. In pregnancy, we're screening for things like protein and glucose. The three components of a urinalysis include a visual exam, a dipstick, and a microscopic exam. So starting with the visual exam, what are we looking for? We're assessing the color, clarity, foam content, and odor. So normal urine should be colorless and clear with no foam content and normal to no odor. Some variations of this can include blood in the urine. That could be an indication that there's a problem with the kidneys. Certain medications or certain foods in your diet can alter the appearance of your urine. So important to know what medications you're taking or if you eat large amounts of certain types of foods. For example, beets. Beets can cause your urine to look a little red, which could be mistaken for blood. So we want to make sure that we're telling doctor, telling the nurse meds and dietary things too that could affect our urine. The clarity, we want it to be clear, um, so cloudy urine could indicate a problem like an infection. Sometimes cloudy urine is okay because things like your skin cells can end up in your urine and it might make it look a little bit cloudy. So clarity is something we look for. Foam content, what we're looking for is protein. So the higher the foam content, the higher the protein. And then odor, if it has a bad odor that is usually more associated with infection. The second part of the exam is the dipstick test. So as you can see, that tests for several more things than just the visual exam. So the acidity, so the pH of the urine. So this can tell us if there's like signs of infection, protein, so normally in our urine, there's very, very small levels of protein, so not to be concerned. If you have higher levels of protein than usual, than normal, it could be a sign of a kidney problem. Glucose, again, normally in our urine, there is so little glucose that it's barely even detectable. So if you have glucose in your urine, you might be worked up for something like diabetes. Ketones also, very similar to glucose, in that it can indicate the need for follow-up testing for diabetes. Bilirubin. Bilirubin is not normally found in the urine, so that would be an unusual finding to have it there. So if it is there in the urine, that can be an indication that there's liver disease going on with your patient. Nitrates. Nitrates in the urine can indicate a bacterial infection. Leukocyte esterase, also related to infection. If there's blood in the urine, that could be a couple of different things. It could be signs of a kidney infection, kidney stones, cancer, like bladder cancer, kidney cancer, things like that. One thing we do have to be careful of, sometimes if the woman is menstruating and a little bit of that blood gets into the urine with the sample, um, that can affect the results. So we need to know that about our patient when we get this result. 
Um, and then finally, the specific gravity. This is the concentration of the urine. So this has to do with fluid status. So how hydrated is your patient at the time of collecting the sample? And the third part is the microscopic examination. So what are we looking for in this part? We're looking for white blood cells, which could be evidence of infection or inflammation in the body. Red blood cells, so blood. Epithelial cells. So it's okay to have some epithelial cells seen. It's normal, right? They're skin cells. It makes sense. Um, but an excessive amount is what's abnormal. That could indicate things like infection, inflammation, or cancer. Cas. So there are several different types of casts. Some are perfectly normal to be seen, and then some would be abnormal and would be signs of something like um, infection. And then all abnormal, right? Bacteria, yeast, and parasites. So we don't want to see any evidence of bacteria, yeast, or parasites when we are doing our microscopic examination. That would not be normal. And the last thing I wanted to point out, when we talk about a UA, we're usually are talking about the one-time UA, which is you go to your doctor's appointment or you're hospitalized, and then they have you get a sample of your urine one time and they test it. So that's what probably we think of. But there is a second type of urinalysis that some people have to get. This is called the 24-hour urine, and it's exactly what it sounds like. So we collect all of your urine over a 24-hour period, and then we test it using these same three criteria, but it's more urine. So this is like a one-time sample in a little cup, and this is all of your urine in a 24-hour period. So that was my video about urinalysis. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.